ever been to a church and heard a sermon and said to yourself, I bet he worked with that last night. <laughs> no, I didn't talk to my sermon last night. I worked on it all week. And the Lord said, you're not going to preach that sermon today. I said, Lord, what are you doing to me? He said, you have a sermon that needs to be preached. So you look at the wall, and that's the sermon. I commend you as a church because you have taken the time and the energy to wrestle with the question, why do we exist as a congregation? What are our priorities for the next five years? What is our focus? And you had a vision committee, church board wrestled with it, you wrestled with it as a church at large. And I want to thank Susan for making such a beautiful presentation of what you came together as a vision statement. You notice the word walking, or more specifically, you notice the first letter, W. You see the three letters, the three prongs there? Anybody know what those represent? Three angels' message. So at the very outset, you've made it a commitment to say to yourselves and to your community that we exist to proclaim the three angels' messages. Amen. Not in Revelation 14. And I invite you to open your Bible to Revelation 14. Verse, starting with verse 6. So next week I'll preach Daniel 12. <laughs> but you can't argue with the Lord when he says you need to do something different. <laughs> Revelation 14, verse 6. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. Isn't that encouraging? Yes. That it's everlasting. When we leave this planet, on the resurrection morning, when Jesus comes in the clouds of glory, it will be forever. There will be no end. The everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. So we're all, every one of us, are commissioned to share with our families and our friends and our neighbors, the people we work with, to share with them this everlasting gospel. See, it doesn't say the pastor is to preach it. It says that we are his messengers. Sing with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountain of waters. We are called to invite people to make God number one in their life. Amen. Number one. That's a challenge in our country today. There are so many voices out there telling us that there is no God or that they're God. And our mission as a church and as individuals is to share this wonderful God that we worship, who was a creator who's made everything. You think of the, the, the amazingness of just a flower or fruit or the bees or the even the bugs that we don't care much for. But God created all these things. We are not an accident. We are his creation. And the world needs to know there's hope. And that hope is in serving God. So your first area of focus is proclaiming those three angels' messages, calling people out of Babylon, out of confusion, inviting people to study the Word of God and to discover for themselves God's plan and God's solution to this great controversy between Christ and Satan. We are his ambassadors. And, and as a church, you have made the statement, we want to be ambassadors for Christ. Amen. 
And someone says, well, what do you say to a person? Well, the most important question people want to know is, does Christianity really work? Does trusting Jesus really change your life? And that's a wonderful opportunity to share how God has changed our life. Because every one of us has a story to tell of how their life is different today because of Jesus Christ. Amen. Just think what a mess we would be without Him. How confused we would be. How depressed we would be. Do Christians have problems? Oh, yes. But we have a God to look to. We have a Christ to guide us. We have a Holy Spirit to lead us to answers to the solutions. Then it says, walking together. So as a church, you have said, we, we want to be unified. We want to be in harmony. Do you enjoy that special music? Amen. Think of the harmony that took place there. Just think what would have happened if each of those ladies had chosen to play different notes. That would have been challenging. But, but they blended in harmony. And we all have different opinions, different ideas, different ideologies, different agendas. But our goal is to blend together in harmony for the cause of Jesus Christ. To share with the world that there is a God. And that He's coming. And yeah, the world's a mess. It's a huge mess. But there's hope. And it's walking together. You know, Paul says that we need to be, we need to encourage one another. We need to pray for one another. We need to uplift one another. That's what walking together means. And then in Christ. If you open your Bibles to Romans 3, verse 24. We need to be in Christ, allowing Christ to be in us. Romans 3, verse 24. This is being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Isn't that encouraging? We don't save ourselves. We don't have the power to overcome sin. You know, um, John Wayne used to say, you need to pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Did you know that's humanly impossible? You have to be, the only place you could do that would be on the moon where there's no gravity. And yet we keep trying to do that, pick ourselves up by the bootstraps. And Paul says, we need to trust Jesus. We need to allow Christ to be inside of us, guiding us in our decisions and our choices. Turn to Romans 8, verse 1. Romans 8, verse 1. One of the most encouraging verses in Scripture. Therefore, there is now no, how much? No, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. <coughs> you know, the devil is good at criticizing us. He is really good. When Martin Luther was in the, the towers being protected, and he was... He was translating the Bible from, from Latin to German because he was a German citizen. And, and he was wrestling with, with this verse and others like him. The, the devil began to make a list of all his sins. And the devil put his hand over something that was very important. And Luther had to admit all those sins are true. And when the devil criticizes us, even though he's a liar, he's often done true. But we are sinners. And we do make a lot of mistakes. And Luther finally had to say, move your hand. He said, our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's why there is no condemnation. It's like that couple I've told you about that we were in counseling and the, and the, the 
counselor said, what's the problem? He said, well, the problem is my wife is hysterical. He said, don't you mean hysterical? No, she remembers every mistake I made and she reminds me. <laughs> you ever been like that? Yeah. You ever been tempted to remind some of their mistakes? Don't you think there are people who probably wanted to remind Mary Magdalene of all her mistakes? Or maybe Peter of all his mistakes? Or maybe Paul the Apostle of all his mistakes? You know, the devil's good at that. And Jesus says, don't listen to the condemnation that comes from the devil. One more. Romans 8.39. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from God. Now we can choose to be separated like Judas did, but there's no power on earth, not even Satan, that can separate us. And, and when you read the 12th chapter of Daniel, it talks about there being a time of trouble like this work has never seen. This verse from, is a reminder of why God's people will be faithful. Because Satan does not have the power to separate us from Jesus Christ. He doesn't have that power. And we must not give that power to him. I'm saying, woe is me. I'm just too weak to be faithful. Our faithfulness comes from Jesus Christ. And He is all powerful. Yes. All powerful. So we're walking together in harmony. In Christ. And our problem is when we step outside of Christ. So how do we walk together in harmony? Now the first thing we've committed to is prayer. Being prayer warriors for Jesus. You know, Daniel was a man of prayer. If you're going to be lowered down into a lion's den, you need to be a man of prayer. <laughs> if you're going to be asked to tell a king what his dream is, you need a man of prayer. Because in Daniel 2, when Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm going to execute all the wise men, Daniel said, give me a little time and I'll talk to my God and he'll give you the dream and its interpretation. And when Daniel gathered with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they prayed. They were prayer warriors. And God opened Daniel's mind to that vision that the king had. When Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego were standing alone in front of that golden altar, a golden image, and we're told they would be thrown into a fiery furnace. They were men of prayer. And they were faithful. When it looked like their lives would be snuffed out, they said, our God is powerful enough that he can, he can protect us. But if he doesn't, we will still be faithful. Yes. That's what God needs of us. Several years ago in Cuba, there were three young men, three young Seventh-day Adventists, who were brought before a firing squad because they would not work on Sabbath. And the command was given to aim and fire. What the three young men didn't know, that they were blindfolded, but what they didn't know was that the commander had put blanks in those rifles. And then he said, I had armed like these three men. I could conquer the world. Well, the Lord wants us to be faithful, even under fire, even when someone's annoying you. He wants us to be faithful. He wants us to be prayer warriors. And the research out there tells us that we're not very good at praying. But we need to commit to it because it's a walk with the Lord. It's time with Him. And then there's love. 
This is unconditional love. Remember, Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer, Father, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. That's a hard prayer to pray, isn't it? And some people you just want to hit over the head with a two by four. And the Lord says, I'm not hitting you over the head with a two by four. So we need to treat people the way we want God to treat us. Amen. Kindness, compassion, mm -hmm. and love. Unconditional love. Remember Peter asked Jesus that question? Lord, how often do we forgive? And Peter gave a number, and the Lord said, well, I have a better number for you. 70 times 70, 490. Just think. Jesus says you can stop forgiving a person after 490 years of forgiving. That's a pretty good answer, isn't it? In other words, Jesus says there's never a reason not to forgive a person. It doesn't mean that you don't help them be successful. But it means that you forgive them so that you can empower them to be victorious. Amen. Our clock is never a very good friend. Yes. But you look through the Old and New Testament and you see men and women who were prayer warriors. Hannah on her knees weeping and praying that God would give her a son. God did. The great prophet Samuel. You have Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane praying, Father, thy will be done. Jesus could have said, you know, humans aren't worth it. But he didn't. He said, we are more than worth it. That's why it's important to love each other. Because we're all valuable. There's no one who lacks value. This world needs a lot of love, a lot of godly love, a lot of unconditional love. There is so much confusion on biblical love versus worldly love. And then there's health. Now, what does the servant of the Lord tell us about health? Raymond, what does the Lord tell us about health? Okay, there for a minute. What does the Lord, what does Ella White tell us about the health message? It is the right arm, the right arm third inch message. And so as a church, you've committed to making the health message very much part of who you are. The right arm of the gospel. So what's, if the health message is the right arm of the gospel, what's the left arm? I'm a lefty, so it's important to me. Righteous by faith. Amen. Is the left arm. Someone asked that one, what, what's the relation of the message to Christ our righteous? He said, that's what the whole three message is about. Christ our righteousness. And so our health message must also be bathed in the righteousness of Christ as an empowering, as hope. This, this church has been faithful in doing cooking schools, inviting people from the community to learn the art of healthy living. And, uh, some of the church came up with an acronym of creation of different areas of healthfulness, sunshine, water, my dad, I think I told you last a couple weeks ago, my dad was told by his doctor he needed to drink more water. And I asked him, how much you drink? He said, two cups a day. He was proud of himself. I said, well, try eight. <laughs> Most people don't drink eight glasses of water a day. Or get sunshine. Or get health of or spend time with their Lord. And they wonder why they're so stressed out. The last but not least is sharing. God has called us to share with others. 
There are so many truths that have been buried. And we've seen and read through the great controversy how God has used different men to bring to our attention these hidden truths. Like Martin Luther and the message of righteousness by faith. Or Martin Luther and the message that soul scripture, that everything we believe must come from the Word of God. And you remember Ellen White said, if we had been faithfully studying the Word, we wouldn't have needed her writings. Yeah. It's quite an indictment against us, isn't it? Yeah. And she reminds us that her writings are the lesser light, and the Bible is the greater light. Amen. That our theology, our understanding of our walk with Jesus must come from these words. And did you know that, that of the 28 fundamental beliefs, not one of those came from Alan White. They all came from the Bible. They all came from our pioneers wrestling and struggling. From time to time, the Lord would use her to nudge them and say, look at this direction. And study and study the scriptures. You know, William Miller, his philosophy of Bible study was to take one chapter at a time, one verse at a time, and study that verse until you understand it, and then move on to the next verse. Mm -hmm. I would certainly encourage you to do that, because when you're sharing with people, and you have a verse in your mind, you can use that verse to encourage people. My dad is a, he's not an Orthodox Catholic, but he is, he is a, a faithful Catholic. And he believes that my mother's in heaven. And as we have these conversations every so often, there's only so far you can push a person without pushing them away. And then there's a, this doctor in the Cherry Hill Fire. When I was introduced to the Seventh day Sabbath, that was easy to accept. But because I was so uh, brainwashed on the eternal hellfire, it took me over a year to understand that there is no eternal hellfire. Isn't that good news? Amen. And yet that doctrine has done more to turn people away from God. I remember one day having a, an argument with God. You ever had those times where you argue with the Lord? You know we never win, do we? And I said to God, there has to be an eternal hellfire because if you live righteously, you deserve to go to heaven. And if you live unrighteously, you don't deserve to go to heaven. You know what the Lord said to me? 